It's that time. Welcome to the Time to Man Up podcast. And here's your host, Sean Hess. Well, I'm glad to have Dave Phillips back with us as we continue into this episode looking at worship. And uh, we previously looked at Dave's experience, what brought him to where he is, and the importance of men worshiping. Uh, a powerful God that we don't underestimate who he is, a God that is worthy of all of our worship. We've looked at Warren Wiersbe's book, Real Worship, and on the cover, he poses this question, is worship a playground, a battleground, or a holy ground? And then he breaks it down into four areas. We are going to walk through each area because they are vital to a man's worship. And so, Dave, welcome back. And uh, we're going to have some good time looking at these four aspects of worship. Good to be here. So the first thing that he talks about is the wonder of worship. Uh, so indescribable by Chris Tomlin. Uh, uh, if you were here for our podcast on the Appalachian Trail, Doug didn't want anybody to bring technology. But I brought my iPod and... When we were on top of the, the mountain, I just took some time to listen to Indescribable. And I'm just going to tell you this. I had sang it before in church, but it was nothing like when I was on top of that mountaintop singing Indescribable and just looking out over God's creation. I want to tell you, if you begin to forget the wonder of God, go and look at his creation. Go take a walk. And think about a God who created all things. And in that, Warren Wiersbe talks about a paradox of Christian worship. And, and, and this is interesting, Dave. He says, we seek to see the invisible, know the unknowable, comprehend the incomprehensible, and experience the eternal. Oh, I, I mean, that blows my mind. We seek the invisible. I've never seen him. I, I, as DC Talk said, you can't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind, right? <laughs> I haven't seen God, but I sure have seen him move in amazing ways. We just went old school on that reference. <laughs> but it also, here's the one that gets me, to know the unknowable. Because I think I know God pretty good. And it's a drop in the bucket. And so, Dave, when we're trying to lead people in worship, we are trying to draw them so that they can know God. And, and Warren Wiersbe says this, our problem is we are finite beings seeking to understand an infinite God and then to express to him our praise and words that are limited by our finiteness. Mm -hmm. How do we do that, Dave? Cool. <sighs> Starting off with a boulder. Um, it, it, I mean, it's like words we can't even have to express, and right? And that's the thing, that the, the English language is so limited. Um, right. And I, I think that's what I love so much about worship. Um, worship through music, anyway. I mean, worship is a lot of things, but worship through music for me. Um, and number one, I'm not good with my words. So I don't know why you chose to have me on here, because I stink at, at speaking and, and doing it well and clearly. but when we add music to it for me it 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 gave me an avenue where i could more i could do a much better job of expressing my love and appreciation for what god has done um and I, uh, in worship leading we're constantly looking at the different attributes of god and trying to point people towards those and and look at who he is look at how beautiful what a beautiful name look at how powerful he is I, but again we're we only have so many words we can use and in fact oftentimes worship music they all use the same words and i start to gloss over those grace and mercy yeah right. we hear it so much that it, it doesn't have as doesn't hold the meaning that it used to that's why when a song comes along and it's got reckless in it, it's like, oh, okay, that's one I've not heard. <laughs> and right. but it, it it challenged me, pushed me a little bit, just to you know what, man, his love is stupid for me. That it, it 
it's not in human terms. And so, yeah, we're trying to right. express who God is in human terms. And it, it, there's nothing that will ever come close to describing how great he is. And we won't know that fully until we're in heaven worshiping around his throne, which is what blows me away. I mean, you, you ended the last uh, episode with the fact that Satan was the lead worshiper. He's, he's right there at the throne room of God, leading angels to worship God. And yet he fell. Right. And that's a wake up call for me, <laughs> man. We can easily look at our own glory and and put it above God somehow. Um, it, it's obviously we don't have the proper position of God in our own lives when we're when we're doing that. But for me, again, I couldn't verbalize how awesome God was, what He means to me in my life. And so when we add music to it. And now we can make a beautiful song, mm -hmm. harmonies, melodies, um, guitar riffs, whatever it might be, rhythms. All this comes together and it produces something more beautiful than just my words by far. And so for me, I really latched on to it because, man, I, this is something that I can gravitate towards and, and really express my love for God. And it, it could be very simplistic lyrics that we, you know, I'm a worship leader. The, the modern worship leader could sing the bridge 18 times, you know, but for me, I, I really right. could, I can lose myself in worship just because I'm able to express fully, more fully anyway, how I feel towards them. There, there was a time in college where I broke my finger on my left hand playing uh, intramural football and uh, I could not bend my, I won't show you which finger it is because I'd be flipping you the bird, but um, I couldn't, I couldn't form chords with it anymore. And so there was, there was like a six month period where I could not play anymore. God took that away from me and I, I could not fully express my worship. I, I felt like I could not worship fully until I was able to play guitar again and add that aspect of my worship to God. Um, so for me, it, 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 it it does a much better job of describing who God is through song, through melodies, through just beautiful music. And, and the beauty of that too is, is we're coming together with other musicians and we're worshiping, we're putting this together, all these different pieces, the drums, the bass, the keys, we're putting all that together and we're making something beautiful. We're offering something beautiful to our God together. And that's exactly what he's called us to in worship. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, the wonder of worship, um, I, I don't think we'll fully understand that until we're around the throne room of God. Um, right. I see glimpses of it here on earth. Um, there, there's definitely been some worship times and, and shoot, Asbury is a perfect example of, man, what happened there? Um, uh, really unique situation. And I, have you ever been a part of anything like that where, where God's spirit just showed up? You, you know, I took kids to a New York city on a mission trip and we had a worship night that uh, they called it a concert of prayer. And uh, we were there for three and a half hours and it felt like 10 mm -hmm. minutes. And I, and I've always told people that when your heart gets to that place of worship time, doesn't matter and uh, it's irrelevant and when we got done it was like 12 30 at night and all the kids were like we've been here that long and it's just man it, it it changes you when you have those experiences and you want to get that again and unfortunately in many of our churches we don't get to that place yeah. because there's too many people holding back but when you get people with a common purpose on a mission trip and they have seen the battles with the, the enemy all day, yeah. man, it's just, it, it's amazing when that happens. Yeah. I was, oh, and, go ahead. And yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, go so ahead. I was a part of the same, same sort of thing. Um, uh, one of our youth missions that we were on all summer, um, went to Israel, Brazil, all over the U S and the last week of, of that youth camp every week it's a different group of youth coming in and that last week 
I mean, we were exhausted. We had nothing more to give. And we always said, hey, the beginning of the week, we've got to have this much energy. And because their energy is down here when they first get there. And eventually it, it changes right. throughout the week. But that week, man, we were exhausted, had nothing left to give. We, I didn't, I don't even remember where we were. I think we were in Brandon, <laughs> Bra Bradenton, Florida, somewhere near you. But, um, hey. and it was the very last night of worship. And uh, it's one of those nights you, you just kind of, you're ready to be done. And I'm just exhausted. I'm playing with a group of, of musicians I had never played with. I got thrown into this band. They had played together, but I had never played with them. I got thrown into it. And um, as we're doing worship. Was that with your clarinet? <laughs> were you using the clarinet? <laughs> that really brings the spirit but, um, in, let um, me tell you. Uh, <laughs> Way to screw up nothing, that moment for you. <laughs> nothing brings the spirit like a clarinet. Uh, you, you know I've got to bring oh, it to you, my man. Do, man. <laughs> anyway, you're in Bradenton so, man, there. <laughs> we start worshiping that night, and, and the weirdest thing happens. One of these youth comes up front as we're worshiping, and he, during a quiet moment, just starts confessing to God. I'd never seen this happen before. Publicly confessing to God his sins, and, and they were real. Like <laughs> He was throwing boulders that night. and um, And then another kid, and another kid, and it just continued. We finished our worship set or three or four songs, whatever it was. And, and we could tell, man, this is the spirit is moving. And so we just continued playing. Right. I didn't know what we were going to play. And it was one of those moments. I can't describe it. I had never played with these guys. I don't know what songs they're going to do next. I don't know what keys they're in. And yet I didn't have to think about it. The chords were there. Everybody was just worshiping. And it was such a sweet spirit that I've never experienced any other time. Um, same thing. The speaker never got up and spoke. Um, in fact, he shut us down about uh, one o'clock. He gets up and said, guys, we got to go to bed. But mm. I didn't want this to stop. You know, it was a glimpse of heaven. Um, where the same thing. It felt like 10 minutes and yet it was hours. And it was so beautiful. Um, and ever since then, that's that's what you're trying to achieve again. You want the spirit to come and move like that again. But yeah, there's there's so many things that's and it's usually selfish, you know, that we're holding back. That's preventing that from happening. And it's not until you step out in faith and start confessing publicly. I mean, that's craziness to think of doing right. that. And yet the spirit met, met us in that place and moved. And it was, it was amazing. It truly was a glimpse of heaven. And uh, man, I, I can't wait to do that for, you know, forever in heaven, eternity. Um, but until then, uh, I'm I'm yearning for more of that here right. on earth. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of things that keep us from. Well, it. what you can do is you you can go back. We had a podcast on the revival there at Asbury, and 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 one of the things that that I stressed in that Dave is this: is that too often we try to reproduce those experiences. When I went to New York City with those kids, I mean, that night was unbelievable. But then we came back and tried to do it with our church, and it was a disaster. And it actually was discouraging to the kids because they're like, why was it so amazing on the mission trip, and now it's horrible? And uh, they couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand it. And it's just because we tried to reproduce something that on that night, God was there doing something. And, and that's okay. It, it, that we, we've got to be okay with that. Job says this, uh, and again, going to Job, he says, how great in, in Job 36, 26, how great is God beyond our understanding? The number of his years is past finding out. And then in chapter 11, verse 7, he says, can you fathom the mysteries mm. of God? Can you probe the limits of the <laughs> Almighty? And I think that's where we're at. And you think, well, those are Old Testament. Well, in Romans 11, 33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge mm. of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Yeah. That's just, that's the God that we serve. And when we understand that, we come with wonder. And men, we need to come with wonder. That's when we go where bushes burn. And then the next area is the witness of worship. A non-believer should be able to come to a worship service and see Jesus through our worship. 
it is my belief that a worship service is not designed for a non-believer. It is for believers to come together and proclaim the truth of God, to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ in their life. But even in that approach to things, someone can see Jesus. Someone can come to know or want to know. And so when we look at the witness of worship, there are threefold. The first one is it's a worship to the Lord. We celebrate him. That's the most important aspect of our witness. So people can come and they can see us worshiping God. And their response can either be, oh my goodness, who is this God that they're worshiping? That's amazing. Or it can be, oh, look at them. They just need a crutch. They need God. And they're just going to go the other way. And you know what? That's okay. Because not all people are going to receive him or accept him. And then there's the witness of edification to the church. There are times, and I tease Dave about this, because there are certain songs when they come on, they're my Dave songs, because I just equate them with him. But what's cool about that is why do I do that? Because when he sang those songs, when he led those songs in worship, it was just different. And I could tell that joy that he had. Uh, there are people that would make comments to me about how I dance up front all the time. When you're standing up front, everybody sees everything you do. And I would even scoot to the side so it wasn't on our live broadcast. But yeah, I like to get into it. Why? Because I'm worshiping. Now, I don't do it so that people see me. But what I know is that guy that I watched lift his hands encouraged me. And if I can be a worshiper and encourage people, then I want to do that. And then the third way it's a witness to the world is it's a proclamation. When somebody visits the church, we proclaim God, who he is. And so, Dave, what I want us to, to help men understand is this. Worship is both horizontal with the body and vertical with God. How do we balance that in a worship service? Because the reality is it should be all vertically directed. But there still is a horizontal aspect of that. And so let's talk about yeah, that. Yeah, um, and so much of what we do in worship is all about balance. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. It's a high wire act. Um, I would say, and it's not, I wouldn't say it's 50-50 balance either. Um, I would say the majority of it is vertical worship because obviously he's, he is worthy of it um, where we are just focusing on who he is, how great he is and declaring that. But the, the horizontal aspect of it too is, is, is nurturing our people and caring for our people as well. Um, they have burdens. They have things that they need to lay down. Um, and we, we need to be in tune to that and we need to invite them to do that. It's also part of our witness too is, is I mean, we can worship about our witness towards others. Um, that, that's part of our worship as well is, is going out as ministers into this world and being a light for Christ. That's something that we do collectively as a church, um, that that light would shine bright in our community. Um, and horizontal is also, it's focusing on people. It's giving an opportunity for conviction, for loving one another, for encouraging. Um, I mean, and I can't tell you how encouraging. I, I loved watching you worship, having you up in front. When, when we're on, yeah. And sing <laughs> well, the wrong hey, songs. I do the same thing. So, hey, uh, I lose myself in worship and I will completely lose the words, forget to come in. And it's, but for us, um, and I, I want our men to know this. It is so encouraging when we see our men and our congregation worshiping. Oh, true. It encourages true. us as worship leaders and it feeds our worship. Um, it, it, there is, <laughs> we did, uh, we did death was arrested not long ago. I think that's the song anyway. And 
we go. Uh -oh. Can you hear me? Oh, I, I think I lost you. one of my. I got. All right. Yeah. I got, I got you still. I may cut out. It you're, seems you're like uh, we're losing battery <laughs> power on my AirPods, but we, we did death was arrested. And um, <laughs> we get to that last verse. Uh, darkness thought it had won. And we let that, we brought the lights down for it. And we just let it hang there for probably 10 seconds. We weren't sure what was going to happen. We just, we wanted to emphasize that. And more importantly, the next line that right. comes up, but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. And man, just the anticipation of that. When we went into that and brought the lights back up, I had never seen our church respond like that. Never. I mean, we're a Baptist church. Yeah. We're fairly conservative. Right. And yet, I right. heard people yelling out to God and amen and yes. And I, I was so blown away that I forgot to sing the next line. I'm like, whoa, what was that? You know, I've got my, my in-ears in. I usually can't hear a whole lot, but man, they were loud that day and they were right. singing with all their heart. And it just, man, it encouraged us as well as worship leaders just to continue on and because we see, we see, we're looking out, we see whether or not people are connecting. And when you see people doing this, it's like, oh, okay, this is not working today. Um, right, right. But man, <laughs> when you see your people worship, it, it feeds one another and it, it flows throughout the entire church and the entire church starts to worship. And it, it's such a beautiful scene. Um, so yeah, it was one of my favorite times in worship where I was just blown away at that. It was not the, I mean, we weren't, we weren't trying to get a reaction. It's not what we were trying to do. We're just trying to, again, right. better express the beauty of who Christ is, what he's done for us. And in that moment, man, I, our people connected to it and wow, blew me away. Yeah, I'm always amazed how often in the mm. Bible it says shout. And yet, if we shout in church, it feels weird. It sounds weird when somebody does it, but we have been called to do it. And so there's a warning that that crosses my mind, and that's this. If you desire to pursue a meaningful worship experience, don't expect much encouragement from the average church person. Because the reality is, is if you're raising your hands, and listen, I've been guilty of this. You question somebody. I mean, I'll see somebody like in an argument before church. And then all of a sudden first song, they've already got their hands up. And I'm like, ah, I just don't know how that's possible. But the reality is mm -hmm. mind your own business. It's, it's about where is my heart? And if my heart is worried about, is their heart right? Well, then my heart can't be focused on God. And what happens is if we worship God the way that we should, there are going to be people that question our motivation. Who cares? And so men, we need you to be like bold trendsetters that you're willing to step out and worship God and be a witness. I mean, can you imagine if you're in church and you're worshiping God and your boys, and I don't mean your kid boys, I mean your boys, your fellas, they're seeing you worship. They're going to be like, dude, what's up with him? That's awesome. And so we need to make sure that we're doing that. Now, I, I want to keep us going here. And the next thing is the warfare of worship. And, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about Lucifer, but there is some serious warfare that goes on with worship. When we see uh, Lucifer wants to be worshiped, he's working hard to get that done. And he will come at us. He will do everything he can to hinder our worship of God. And so we need a, to take time to step back and consider the different ways the enemy hinders our worship. It's a daily battle with the enemy that impacts not just our corporate worship, but our personal worship. Uh, Warren Wiersbe says this, a worshiping church must of necessity be a warring church for true worship mm. is spiritual warfare. William Temple said, this world can be saved from political chaos and collapsed by one thing only, and that is worship. And then finally, Warren Wiersbe says, the only hope for the world, get this, the only hope for the world is the church. 
and the only hope for the church is a return to worship. You see, the church, Dave, has tried a lot of things. They've tried missions. They've tried bus ministries. They've done a lot of things, Awana, things like that. But the reality is, just nobody wants to admit it, the only hope for the church is to get real about worship. And and it's not just a check the box thing. It's, are you willing men to strip everything away, to strip everything away, your pride? Are you willing to strip that away and just come before God and worship him and not worry about what the person next to you thinks? Until I got to that place, I didn't worship. And I mean, I'm talking through college even. I didn't worship. But once I was willing to strip all those things away and just get real with God about who I am and who he is, I began to experience freedom from the warfare with the enemy. And so when we talk about warfare, listen, we know this. I'm not talking just Sunday morning. I'm talking throughout the week. The enemy is seeing what he can do. I mean, you guys don't know this. Well, hopefully you won't once I do editing. But this has been a colossal mess today. I mean, we have been trying to record this podcast. Right now, my computer is sitting on ice packs, trying to keep it from overheating. It has been a mess. Uh, I mean, if it could go wrong, it's gone wrong today. These last three days, I started recording my curriculum, and it has been a mess. We call that spiritual warfare because the enemy doesn't want the man up study to get released, guys. The enemy doesn't want men to get real with worship. And so the enemy, I'm surprised it hasn't stopped recording right now, but the enemy is going to do everything he can to stop us from worshiping God. And you're going to get more focused on the fact that the screen words didn't get adjusted quick enough. And you're going to forget about worship. You're going to be upset because one of your kids is talking. Who cares? They're a kid. Show them what it means to worship. And maybe you'll turn that disruptive talk into worshiping God. But we've got to set that pace. And let me tell you, that warfare is happening with the worship team. They practice once a week or whatever. Don't believe that Satan's not attacking them through that week. And I'm going to tell you this. If you are on your worship team, so get ready because I'm going to tell you this. If you are on the worship team and you are in the middle of spiritual warfare, there are some times where you need to step off the team. If you've got sin in your life and it's weighing you down, you got to, you got to step off the team. And here's why. It's a spiritual battle. But I've also seen this. There was one Sunday. I can't remember who was in the worship team. But I was up front and I had an issue going on. And I'm like, oh, crud, what am I going to do? I mean, I've got to preach. And we're on the last song before the host comes up. And I've got to get up there. And I was this close to walking off and saying, we're not going to have a message today. I mean, really, I was. Because I can't get up and be hypocritical when I've got a struggle in my life. And it wasn't a sin issue. It was just I was having some battles in my head with somebody had done something, and it was bothering me. And I'll never forget in that last song, there was this moment where God just, I didn't get down on my knees. I didn't do that. But in my mind, I was on my knees, and I was before God. And God did this amazing work in that last song. And I can't even remember the last song, what it was. But he transformed me to get me up there to preach. I'm going to tell you this. Man, you need to be praying for your worship team. You need to be praying for your audiovisual team. You need to pray for your pastor every week. Because when you step into spiritual leadership in the church, you step onto the battlefield. And so Dave kind of, I know I went on there with the warfare of worship, but I just, I believe that it's one of the most underrated areas that we just kind of gloss over. 
And there's a reason why God says, put on the armor of God. Because our enemy can kick our butts. And men, you've got to step up. And you've got to get your, your family to church and ready to worship God. And talk about it after. But they, how have you had to battle with spiritual warfare when it comes to worship? Oh, man. Um, yeah. So this is yeah, a I was going to say, other well, episode, episode 14 I think. here now. Um, yeah, this, this one could go on for days. Because <laughs> uh, there's so many different ways that the enemy attacks. Um, there's so many different avenues. And he knows what buttons to push. Um, there's so many pieces and parts that we have no control over. We can be prepped and ready as practiced as possible. And all it takes is one thing to, to fall apart. Um, a, a string breaks on your guitar um, to a mic not working to the screens not working to, I mean, you name it. And there's so many things and there's so many technical pieces involved. And again, shout out to our technical guys, because holy cow, you're doing video, you're doing words up on the screen, you're doing live sound. You ha we have a whole nother room now where we're doing online sound. You, you've got, right. who knows how many mics involved. I think we're using like 32 channels on our soundboard. That's 32 chances wow. of something going wrong. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, that's called juggling, <laughs> those guys right? are amazing. Um, and it doesn't always work. And, and sometimes it's out of our control. Um, and it's humbling. It, but we have to look at it differently. It's very easy to get distracted by those things, to get upset, to get angry. To, God, this was supposed to go right today because I, I want your message to be heard. I want the unbelievers to, to find you. And yet... God is still in control. We lose that, that we lose sight of that. Instead, we're looking at this, whatever problem it is, whatever distraction it is, we get focused on that. And yet some of those Sundays, it's amazing um, where it was for us a complete train wreck. It's amazing. The people that come up afterwards and say, man, worship was amazing. It really, God was speaking to me during that time. I'm going, which, what service did were you a part of? Because <laughs> that was that was not my experience. Right. That was an absolute train wreck. And that's the thing. Spirit, God's spirit's going to move. And in fact, when spiritual warfare is happening, we need to be thinking completely different, completely opposite. Instead of being focused on those issues, going, okay, God, what are you doing then? There's something happening here that Satan doesn't want happening. And, and I want to be a part of that. Right. And so I've learned to look at it in that way that, hey, we're, we're being attacked. There's a target on our back. God's going to do something awesome here. Um, and so I, I can't wait to see what it is. And even if, you know, everything falls right. apart, I know that God is so much bigger than that. He's got this in his control. Um, I have to remind myself of that. Um, but the other thing it does is it's a constant reminder for me, too, that, hey, this isn't my ministry. This is God's ministry, and he's going to do whatever the heck he wants with it. I'm just happy to be a part of it. And part of that is being prepped and ready so that when things go wrong, you can continue on anyway. I mean, if we're just winging it, those little distractions can completely ruin a service and can throw us off of our game but if right. we're prepped, we're ready, and we're asking God to move, we're asking him to, to show up and take control of that, that worship time, he's faithful to do it. And, and again, he's, he's going to bless our preparation yeah. as well. And he's, We just have to stay focused on, on the fact that God is moving. No matter what's happening, God is still moving. And we can help our people see that as well because they're going to notice that things are going wrong. Things are falling apart. But, hey, we're, we're going to continue to worship God anyway because, you know what, God's bigger than that. And we don't need that to worship him. All this stuff that we've added in, we don't really need. We don't even need a guitar. We don't need the band. We can worship right. God without any of this. So right. Satan, have at it. Go to it. We're going to worship God anyway because 
he deserves it. He is well worthy of it. And uh, so we do, we have to look at those distractions differently, but also as uh, guys, we need your prayer. And when you show up to church, show up with a heart ready to worship, be praying with your family that, hey, God, come and move. I need to hear from you today. That's my prayer every single, every single week is I personally, right. God, I need you. I need you to move. I need to hear from you today. I need to see you for who you are. Remind me. Come and meet with me. During this time of worship, during my offering of worship, please yeah. come and meet with me. Give me what I need. I don't even know what I need. You do. Come and meet me here, God. Right, right. It's great. It's it's great to know that in warfare, the Bible says, mm. and the gates of hell will not prevail. And so we're already going to win this. We just got to stay the course and keep going. And so the final thing that he talks about is the wisdom of worship. And I'm just going to touch on this because we've got some other things I want to get to with more of the mm. practical application type of things. But when it comes to the wisdom of worship, we talk about the transcendence of God. And Psalm 8, 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth, you have set your glory above the heavens. That's the transcendence of God. That's how great he is. He's above everything. And then you have the eminence of God. Uh, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? That's Psalm 8, 4. So in the same chapter, we see that aspect of it. There must be balance in that because what happens is this. If we think too much of the transcendence of God, we place him so far up that we feel that he's out of grasp that we can't even understand him. But the problem is if it becomes too leaning toward the eminence of God, he becomes this buddy, buddy type of thing. And I just want you to remember this when you're worshiping God, that that same God that is your Abba yeah. father can also strike you dead. I mean, really that's what it is, is there. He's just this with one word that could be the end of you because he's God. So he's not just merciful and gracious and forgiving. He's also righteous, holy, and just, and there has to be balance in that understanding of that. And as we grow in our knowledge, what that does is that increases our worship. Now, those are the areas of that, but what I want to really hit on today is to worship in spirit and truth. This is one thing that has always been big to me. In John 4, 23 to 24, Jesus says, but an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I love the series Chosen. I just, man, I, I eat that thing up. I love it. I've watched it multiple times uh, just because to me, it makes it real to me, man. I mean, I'm just like, sometimes you read the Bible and you think of superheroes and stuff, but they're real people. But that scene where Jesus is at the well and he says this, man, I'm like, yes. Because the, the thing is, is that the worship of some churches leans so much toward truth that they forget about the spirit. But there's another side that there are some churches that are so into the spirit that there's not a lot of truth there. They're all into the feely emotional side of things that they forget. There still are some truths about God that we need to be aware of. So that's why God desires us to have balance in that. When you can have balance in spirit and truth. And when I say balance, I'm not saying 50, 50. But I'm just saying where you're not all one way or the other. Because some services may be more about truth. Some services may be more about feel. But let me tell you this. When I read the Psalms, I hear a lot of spirit. I hear David worshiping in spirit about his experiences and what God did. And so, Dave, how do we get men, how do we get believers to worship with a balance of spirit and truth because going extreme in either direction can be the downfall of worship in the church. Yeah, I love that passage. Um, one of my favorite things about that passage, I mean, when you hear him say those words, if you're just reading that, you would think that the father is looking for those who 
worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. You would think he'd be saying that to someone spiritual, to the religious leaders. Right. He's, he's at a well. Not only is he talking to a woman who the Bible doesn't mention very often. It's a, not the thing Culturally, to do. That wasn't it's a Samaritan the woman. He's not supposed <laughs> to be the tradition say you right. shouldn't be talking to this woman and yet that's the very person that he's spilling god's truth out to just revealing himself man i love that <laughs> means that i don't have to be a religious leader or a philosopher or a god can reveal his truths to anybody and right and he does that in worship as well um yeah spirit and truth man our biggest goal is to be genuine. You don't want it to be so, so prepped that it's mechanical. Um, you have to, you have to be prepped, but at the same time, you have to be ready for the spirit to move and do whatever he's going to do. Um, and that just means we're ready. God show up and move. And Hey, if that means we hang on this one song and we, we continue on this because people are connecting to it, that's what we're going to do. Uh, genuine, passionate, right. heartfelt worship is what we're after. Um, and it's not something, I don't think it's something that there's nothing I can do to, to make that happen. There's things I can do to help, but the spirit's got to be there. The spirit's got to meet us and, and, help us to do that, provoke us to do that, lead us to do that. Um, and again, a, a lot of what we've talked about comes into play there, seeing God for who he is. Um, if we focus too much on truth, yeah, it, uh, we lose a portion of who God is. We focus too much on spirit. You know, I, I, I conjure up thoughts of, um, you know, people rolling on the floor and running up and down the aisles. And it doesn't have to be that. It's 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 a combination of the two, where there is there is, we're worshiping the truths of God, but we're also seeing God's spirit moving, and we're open to wherever He wants to go. It's laying our own self down, our selfish desires down, right. and being willing to okay, God, what are you calling me to? What what step of faith are you asking me to take? Um, and that's a tough spot to come to because it's, again, it's out of our comfort zone. God is going to push us. He's never going to call us to something that is easy, simple, and maybe already in our abilities. He's always going to call us to something beyond, to step out. Um, and when, when unbelievers come into our church and they see people worshiping wholeheartedly, heartfelt, true, genuine worship, it is inviting to them. When we err on one side or the other, it's not inviting to. But when, when those two are, are, are married together and you have worship and true spirit and truth, boy, that is, people want to be a part of that. They want to know what's going on. Who is this God that you're willing to lay everything down for, sacrifice everything for, and worship? And especially when men do that. People are going to ask, hey, who is this God? Um, because, again, oftentimes it's seen as not manly. It's um, kind of girly. It's music. It's, it's um, no, our yeah, God is a right. manly God. And he is calling us to be manly men, to worship him in spirit and truth, to worship him passionately with all of our heart, and not just on Sundays. That means throughout the week as well, that we're worshiping God in everything that we do. We're giving him our, our all, even in our jobs. We do everything we do to the glory of God. Um, then it's, it's even seen outside of the church. It's seen by the people around us in our jobs, uh, by our friends, our, our family, who may not know Christ, may not be believers. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it's, and again, it comes back to that, that journey of worship, man, if we can help people through that journey of worship on a Sunday, we, we hope that that happens and that the spirit moves and, and meets us there. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's wholeheartedly relying on, on the Holy Spirit to come and take, take over for us, take control to move 
to lead us. And, and sometimes that means completely scrapping what we've planned and doing whatever he's calling us to and whatever, wherever he's moving, it's following. It's, it's not, right. God, you, this is what I've planned out. Come and work within these, these bounds, um, these boundaries, but Lord, Hey, blow those boundaries out. I can't wait to see because what I've planned is so much smaller compared to what you can actually do. Come and blow the walls out. We want right. to see you move right. in this place. Um, and, that, and that's got to be our heart, our passion, or our prayer um, going into worship. Yeah, and, and we have a responsibility, and, and I'll just like briefly share. When, when I was at Grace, uh, uh, there were some individuals that complained about the music and because of who were the artists who wrote the music and, and that when I, when I'm singing worship music, I'm not thinking about who wrote the song. I'm just worshiping God. And uh, so, so I don't think a lot about that, but I came up with a, I basically compiled a bunch of aspects of what should determine a, a good song for corporate worship. And we came up with these just basic principles of it exalts God it's biblical truth. And, and I felt I wanted those at the top of the list because that's what it's about. If it's not biblical truth, guys, it doesn't belong in our worship. I mean, I know that's maybe hard if you're a worship leader, but I think we try to put too many things in there that are not about biblical truth. It can be experiential or it can be about God, but it has to be biblical truth. It also shouldn't be, it should be participation, not performance. There are some songs that just the people can't sing and it becomes a performance. And the fourth thing is singability. Uh, I've had a couple of times where I've had to go to the worship guys and just say, Hey, listen, great song. It didn't really translate. You really can't sing it because if the people can't sing it, then you've lost what you're trying to do in leading worship. And they also need to be able to sing it once and know what it's about. If it takes you explaining it for eight weeks, what the song is, well, it's going to be really difficult. And so it needs to be able to be understood. It needs to be responsive. We want our people to respond to that music, whether it's responding in a certain way to God or whatever it is, we want them to do that. And it should always say something in a way that points people to the gospel. And uh, even though it's not evangelistic in nature, we still want it to point people to God. And so that brings me to a few areas that as a worship loving person uh, drive me batty. And so get ready fellas. Cause I'm about ready to unload <laughs> some, some, some truth about this. The first thing is this lyrical repetition. Now I acknowledge that some songs repeat too much. I remember Michael W. Smith's song forever. Uh, we did it up in Michigan one time and I thought it went forever and I thought that it needed to be stopped because at some point you lose the people. But what the problem is, is that I think too often the people that like support the hymns point that out about newer music, that it's too repetitive brothers. I'm pretty familiar with the hymns and there's a lot of repetition, not only in the words, but the, da, 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 and I'm not hating on it, but don't just take repetition and throw something out because of that, because they have made repetition, the issue rather than what's being said. Now I want you to hear this revelation four, eight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around within. And day and night, they never cease to say. Now, that's kind of crazy situation going on, right? But they, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's pretty simple. Is somebody really going to go up to God and say, man, could they stop being so repetitive? I mean, truth is truth in proclaiming that truth. Now, we don't want to lose our congregation. 
We don't want to lose our worshipers. But we've got to be careful to just throw something out because there is a lot of repetition. Now, I'll say this. There are some songs on certain days when I listen to, it feels like a lot of repetition. But there are other days that I listen to that same song and it's hitting me here. I don't know what that day is going to be, but God knows. And when I see that repetition, there's no way in the middle of that I'm going to stop God and say, hey, can we like, get some different words to this? Because those lyrics are getting kind of old. Uh, there is a, the Michael W. Smith song, This Is How I Fight My Battle. Uh, man, repetition galore. But do you know what? There are times when I'm struggling in life when Satan seems to be kicking me in the gut that I turn on that song and I don't care how many times he keeps singing it, I'm claiming it. Uh, I'm claiming the fact that it may look like I'm surrounded, but who I'm really surrounded by is God. And I'm claiming it. And so I'm just saying this. Worship leaders, be wise with repetition. It's just like a pastor that gets up at the end of the service, right? And he's like going and going and going. And you're saying, just wrap it up, brother. You've said your word. Let me respond now. Because a pastor shouldn't have to draw people into response. In the same way, when the song has done its work and we proclaim the truth, let it go. But there are times when God is moving and I'm just going to say this to my, my, my people in worship. Keep it going. It's okay. Let people respond. Let it percolate a little bit. But if we are more upset about how long a song went, then that's saying, again, something about our heart more than it is about anything else. And then, here we go. Boulders. <laughs> my computer is all wrecked now, right? I've got my computer all up all over the place. I'm telling you, that's what kind of day it's been. The battle between worship and concert. As a pastor, I got so sick of people saying it's too much like a concert. Dave, I don't know about you, but I've been to some concerts. There is no way any worship service I have ever been to looks like a concert. So I don't know if these people that say that have never been to a concert before. But, I mean, we turn up the volume just a little bit. And people are like, it's like a concert. We turn on lights a little bit. It's like a concert. I mean, I remember one time we put the lights where they went with the, the, the beat. And you would have thought that we worshiped Satan that day. Because people were like, what was that about? And I'm like, it was kind of cool, wasn't it? And they're like, that was like a concert. Well, we didn't have any flames shooting out or anything. I mean, I'm the dude that used a <laughs> smoke blower in one of my messages one time. Yeah, I, I, you would have thought maybe I would have got kicked out. But listen, churches sometimes make it more of a performance. Yes, I agree with that. But what we have to understand, I think Warren Wiersbe says this well, a Christian congregation gathers to worship Jesus Christ and to glorify him while an audience assembles to see or hear a performance. The unifying factor in the congregation is God. That's what we're about. It's not about the lights. It's not about the sound. But it's about who we're coming, that unification that we have. Individuals in an audience assemble as spectators. Individuals in a congregation come together as participants, as worshipers. And those who lead worship must be focused on leading a congregation in worship more than a production. And Dave, I don't know about you, but I think when we become more concerned about a production is when we're more worried about everything being perfect. When we're just about bringing our offering before God, it doesn't matter if it's a frail offering, a broken offering, but we bring it before him. I was once told this in my previous ministry. So if they listen to this, they're going to know I'm talking about them. We had the lights down and they said that our worship was of the devil. 
because we kept the light slow and darkness represents sin. And that Jesus is the light. And if we are worshiping Jesus, it should be bright and the light should be on. I'm pretty sure that David worshiped in a cave sometimes. And when I heard that, I thought, what in the world are you talking about? So I'm going to tell you two truths. Know this to be true, not scientifically proven, but these are true truths. And Dave can have my back on this one or not. He can even kick back on me if he wants on this. People sing louder when the music is louder because they are more willing to sing when they feel like others won't hear them sing. Number two, people express themselves in worship more when the lights are lower because it makes them feel more safe. Nailed it, brother. Thank you so much for it's yours. <laughs> saying that, declaring that those things are true. Um, uh, <sighs> We're not there for a concert. The difference is the audience. Um, at a concert, the audience is the people that paid tickets. You know, they, they came to see a performance, came to hear how great the people on stage are. In worship, everybody, the people on stage, as well as the people in the congregation are one. They are the band together declaring how awesome our audience of one is. That's the biggest difference. And like you said, everything else that we do is just to help our people along to worship. Louder music. To a point, anyway, there, there is a limit, but louder music does help people to sing out and not be afraid. Lowering the lights, in my opinion, if I had it my way, I'd have the lights completely off. That way you can't see me. You can't see the band members. It, the focus is completely off of us. Um, we're at that point focusing on nothing but the music and the words and how great our God is. Um, obviously, it doesn't matter what we do. Our job description is not people pleaser because we're never going to please them all. <laughs> you know that to be so true because you hear you hear all the complaints. It's the worship's too loud. The worship's too soft. The lights are too bright. The lights are too low. That song sung by somebody that um, is sister-in-law's uncle might have been part of a cult. And it's like, wow, you know. We are looking for reasons not to worship instead of coming with a, a worshipful heart, ready just to, to sing God's truths. And without that, yeah, we're going to be selfish. We're going to want things our way. One thing I have learned as a worship leader over a lot of years, and it took a lot of years to learn this, is I believe there are at least two different types of people within worship. There are those that love truth, and they just want songs chock full of truth. They don't care about the melody, how it goes. They don't care. All they want is scriptural songs. And then there's the other side. There's those that they, they could worship to two lines in a song over and over and over and over. And that's me. And so I would always push that other side. Just We don't need that. I found that there is a balance and we have to have that balance as a worship leader that, Hey, we have both people in our congregation. Right. Um, and I'm not just helping those that agree with me on what worship should be to worship God. Now, in fact, I, ha I have to build a worship set that has both that helps us all to worship God. But we also have to come into that place knowing that, Hey, not everybody worships the same way as I do. And so, yeah, not every song's for me. Actually, none of the songs are for me. That, that should be our mindset is that all these songs are for God. Right. It, it all starts with our heart and where our heart is. So um, and, and I would just pose, Dave, that these people that make an issue about the loudness of the music or the lighting level. You, do you know what I never heard a complaint about is why do we put every passage on the screen yeah. and keep people from looking it up in their yeah. Bible? I think that's a bigger problem 
because we're we're growing up a generation of believers who don't even know how to work their way through the Bible. Now with apps that we have, I feel weird using my app. I still bring my big old Bible to church, and I just feel weird on the app. I mean, last time I preached, <laughs> I preached from my iPad, brother. You know it, Grace. I never did that. And I was like, I didn't know if I was like going to be cool now because I preached from my iPad. I was scared to death. I was so scared that I put my notes in the front of my Bible just in case my iPad went bad. And I was just like, I didn't trust it. After I did it, I was like, oh, I like that. It was something new. It's something different. But I still had my Bible up there with me, open to the passage, even though my verses were in, on my iPad. There's something about having your Bible open to the word of God. Yeah. And so why aren't we upset about that more often? I, I just think that that would be a bigger problem. Now, I'm not saying don't get mad at your church if they have all the words up on the screen. But that, to me, would be more of a concern is that we're growing. Uh, sorry to say this, and I hope this might sound, I mean, that might sound bad. I, not I hope it sounds bad. It probably will sound bad. We're raising ignorant believers when it comes yeah. to knowing where to find things in the Bible. And it's okay to look into the beginning index to find out where something is. But look it up and find it. Take a pen and underline a verse. Because those underlined verses in my Bible, when I hit them on any day when I'm reading through, that's awesome because it reminds me of things. But those are things that we need to be upset about. But I don't want to put too much time on that because we got something else to do because we're about ready to, to put a big boulder in the water now. And we've already been going for some time. But listen. Dave, why do so many men not sing or express themselves in corporate worship? Because I've got to know that some of them sing in their car and in their shower. <laughs> We're all good singers in our shower. You know that, right? We all could have an album when we're in our shower. But why is it that I just feel like women – even if they maybe can't sing, they're willing to like sing it out loud. And, and this isn't like picking on people, fellas, just know that. But we are setting example for future generations of worshipers. Why is it that so many men have a difficult time with that? Uh, it boils down to pride most of the time. I mean, men, men are prideful. It's built into us more than it is women. And so I agree. And pride is a tough thing to overcome. It is so hard to lay our pride down. Um, I mean, we want to be we want to be right at all times. And and again, that's pride. We never want to be seen as weak. We don't want to even tiptoe along a line that might you know be seen as weak. And so mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest struggle for us as men is to not care what other people think, to lay our pride down and to fully give our all in worship. A part of that too, uh, you know, as worship leaders, there's things we can do to help. Um, I mean, song choice is huge. Uh, I mean, when we're singing, as the deer panted for, that's not a manly song. Right. It's not right. manly lyrics. Um, you know, we always look for songs. <laughs> I guess unless somebody yeah. has their bow and arrow out, right? You're, you're in your <laughs> As the deer, I your got it. Stand. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> it's perfect. But you know, there's, a, there's a lot of different songs mm -hmm. that we can choose that are going to help our men to worship. I mean, in the men's retreat, the Man Up Loses that we did, we were very specific on what songs we, we, we chose. And they were usually more the upbeat oh, yeah. songs. Um, more powerful songs usually had more rhythm driving it, drums. Um, and oftentimes the chorus is almost like a anthem. I mean, you, you, when you go to a stadium and mm -hmm. uh, almost any game you go to, they almost always play the, the most common anthem. <laughs> we will. We will yep. rock That's you. That's what went to my mind too. To that song. It's a very <laughs> simple melody. The lyrics are extremely simple, but they're right. like, rock you. You know, it's a manly lyric, and it's got a good rhythm to it. 
right? Yeah. That's really yeah. all we need as men. We do need some help, though, and those things do help. I mean, and courses that just repeat themselves over and over. So, yeah, I know some people get sick of that, but, you know, in, in all honesty, that helps us um, to really engage. And, okay, I, now I've heard it 18 times. I think I can finally join in. Um, I mean, I need that. I mean, think back for you. Right. Um, cause I've been, you know, I've been a believer a long time and worship music has come music, Christian music in general has come so far. I mean, when I was young, all we oh, had was yeah. Sandy Patty and Michael Card or Michael English, or it was terrible. Yes. Yeah, Steve Green. And it Steve was still Green. better than what was before, <laughs> but man, for me, it was awful. Like, I don't, I don't connect to that stuff at all. Right. Do you remember the first band or singer that you connected with as a man where you could just sing it out? And, yes, this this hits my soul. What was it for you? Yeah, what's funny is I live near the guy yes. now that so so Petra was that group. And 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 when when I heard about mm. Petra, I was like, dude, I love this group. And my mom and dad wouldn't let me listen to it. They're yeah. like, nah, we don't, that's not the kind of music. <laughs> and they would say, Hey, Steve green. Yeah. Thumbs up. And, and, uh, so one of our friends that was kind of between my parents age and my age, he was in the middle, but he was friends with my mom and dad. He goes, mm. Oh, you got to tell your son about this great group Petra. And all of a sudden, because he said it was okay. Then my mom and dad let me listen to it. But even my wife and I, we went to a Petra concert because that definitely was, uh, the group that kind of yeah, it was groundbreaking. Could, I mean, I it was, with. it was kind of that seventies rock feel, which I listen to secular music. I love that stuff. It resonates with me, but here they were using Christian lyrics. You know, I am on the rock, the rock of ages. I mean, it was just, it was powerful rock anthems and it changed Christian music for me. I finally had something where I could just crank it up in the car. I wasn't driving back then, but crank it up in the car and, and just shout it out and declare my appreciation, my love for God. Whereas the Sandy Patty songs, nothing against them, but it just didn't do it for me. And so song choice is huge. And so uh, for worship leaders, that, that is something that we have to be aware of is, and again, it, it can't, we can't just gear our worship towards the men. But there are different songs that are definitely going to resonate more with our men than our women. Um, and so we can help them along. But yeah, like you said, it's also bringing that, that the sound, the volume up to a certain level. It's helping with the lights. Try to limit the distractions. Help us right. lay our pride down to declare how awesome God is. Right. And, and and also men need to be listening to worship music outside of the church. Become familiar with it. Uh, I know for our church, they put together a Spotify playlist that has all the songs that we do in church. Take advantage of those things and listen to the music so that when you are there, you have confidence in it because you, you know, the song. And I'll tell you this. I mean, you're a, you're a parent, Dave. And uh, as a parent, I am so grateful for how broad the genres are of music within Christian music now. <laughs> and that as a guy that loved rap, I had no options. And so now there are a number of groups that I love that my kids and I, we listen to it together. And so when NF comes out with a new song, we're listening to it together. And I'm excited that is when his new album comes out and things. And those are all things that when we are listening when we're not getting in the car and listening to just sports talk or news talk or secular music, I'm not saying those are bad, but find some time where you're listening to Christian music. When I get up in the morning instantly, that's what I listen to is Christian worship. And I push random play and I see what God has to say to me that day by what songs come up. And usually there's relevance in Psalm 101. Mm. It says this, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Men, two things, make a joyful noise mm. to the Lord. 
when you go to church, I had a teen that wouldn't, would never sing out loud. And I was always like, man, you need to sing out loud. And he's like, oh, I don't have a good voice. I'm like, you know what? You're making it about yourself and not about God. And I said, you need to sing. So for weeks in youth group, he wasn't singing because, you know, he wanted to be the cool guy that the girls liked. And so, you know, unless you play an instrument, you know, we had a drummer guy and everybody loved him. Clarinet. He could play every instrument in the world. <laughs> and it was so funny, but not clarinet. I don't think he might have been able to. I don't know. But, you know, all the girls were like, oh, he's good looking and he plays instruments. But he could have cared less. He just loved being part of the worship team. And that's not even why he was up there. But this guy wanted that the girls to like him. And so he's like, man, if I sing and they hear me sing, that's not going to go good. And so I said, listen, I read him this verse. And I said, I want you to sing to the Lord, make a joyful noise to him. And that's all that matters. And there was one night in youth group, because I knew it was going to be a hard task for him to give all that stuff up. One night in youth group, he let go and started mm-hmm. to sing. I was almost crying because I knew what it took for him to put himself at risk like that. So men, we need to be willing to, to put ourselves at risk. You know what? He was right. He had a bad voice. It wasn't that great. But I was proud because he was willing to put aside his pride so that he could worship God. And do you know what happened? When guys see him singing, they start singing. And it has this just th- this engaging impact on other people's lives. So I want us to understand that I listened to a podcast one time about a woman whose husband, it was, it was just like death when they did uh, music in the church because he didn't want to sing. And I mean, yep. think, Dave, most worship sets are three to four songs. So now you got a guy standing for three to four songs. He's not singing. That has to be like the longest 15 to 20 minutes in the world, right? I'm singing. Time flies for me. But if you're just standing there, you're like, oh, my goodness. Or if you're new to the church. But if we can take that, men, and begin to sing a joyful noise unto the Lord, it will change that time and make it amazing for us. So I don't know how we get men to that. I believe that Dave hit on that. Part of that is song selection. Part of that is lighting. Part of that is volume. Um, All of those things play a role in it. Um, I love, and I know that at Grace, there's kind of that problem where you come in with one song and then somebody gets up and talks. So we we call that kind of a throwaway song. Or, or, Or if you want to get spiritual, we call it a call to worship. Uh, because that's spiritual. But for yep. me, I like to come in strong with that first song. Because I want to. I want you to forget about your crap from the week. I want you to forget about all the junk. And I think, I may be wrong here, but if we came in stronger on the first song, yep. we would get men's attention. Mm-hmm. We can't come in all feely. Because men just don't respond to that. We need that banner, that bold proclamation. And and again, we can accomplish that, but it takes worship being purpose. Uh, so I'll relate it to this. I think too many churches, the decor is feminine. I loved at our church when we had a decorator who took the decor and she said, we need to make this church more masculine. Thank you. Because we had feminized the church and we want men to come in from the minute they walk in and they're like, we can be here. We love this place. And it's all building toward what a response to worship. And I know some people are going to be like, Oh, decor doesn't matter. It does matter. And what are we, why do you think men go to, I mean, Oh my goodness. Our man up on Wednesday nights, we have about 35 men there in Troy when they sing with just an a, a, an acoustic guitar, they fill that room. They fill it. And, and I'm not dogging on women here, but when men sing, whoa, amazing. And we had some amazing experiences. So I know men can do it. We just got to put them in the right place and they have to strip away that pride so that they can do that. Now, when we 
think about this. We want to venture out where the bushes burn. But we also want to venture out where not just in our individual life, but in our corporate life. All right. So, fellas, we just had like colossal computer go down again. But we are steadfast in this. Because we want to finish strong. I tell people all the time, too many people line up at the starting gate and never finish the race. We're finishing this race. We were almost done. But, Dave, I kind of want to wrap it up by saying, how do we get churches to worship God? How do we get men to worship God in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to him? Um, Transparency is so big. Uh, and that was one of the things when I came to grace, it was one of the first things I noticed is how transparent that church was, how transparent you were as a leader. Um, you were willing to be vulnerable, honest, open on stage about who you were, your struggles, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. We knew who you were. You weren't coming from a righteous place that we couldn't relate to. Um, instead, you were someone that was very relatable. I, I, I mean, I think that's why we bonded so quickly. Um, we have to be genuine. Um, mm-hmm. And it's okay to be honest. Right. Um, I mean, listen, there's days when we come into worship that I'm not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. I was always told, man, we, we can't say that from the stage. We, we have to hide it. We have to pretend. I'm going, Why? why right. that's it's right. not real god knows and the last thing i want to be god accused knows. of is something that yeah god already knows authentic looking genuine and and so i think it's helpful when we can be real especially from stage and say guys can i just be honest with you to begin today pray for me i don't feel like being here doing worship today there's so many other things right are consuming my life, consuming my mind, it should be okay to say that because our people are going to connect with that because guaranteed there's some of them in that same place. And when we can start there, lay those things at the feet of Christ to begin with, well, we've got a foundation where we can finally start pointing our eyes towards Christ and aligning our hearts with him until we lay those things down and including sin, if we're holding on to sin, um, it's disingenuine to come before him and act like we're unsinful. Yep, yep. Um, we've got to come before him, lay those things down right at the get go and say, Jesus, uh, I need you today. And so I'm, I'm praying that you will come and meet with me today and come and feed me because I need you. There's, I've been grabbing out, uh, grasping for other things that I'm hoping will satisfy and they don't, they haven't, they won't. Jesus, I need you and come and meet me here. I mean, that for me, that's the biggest thing is coming in with the, the proper heart. Um, and I want to say this too, men. Right, right. Uh, my, my dad's gone now. He died last summer. One of the lasting memories I have of him is how he worshiped. That will stick with me forever. Again, he was not a... Didn't have a great voice. He wasn't a singer. He didn't play any any right. instruments. But I remember how he worshipped. He would worship with all of his heart. And yeah, did it sound great? No. But he was making a joyful noise and he didn't care who heard it. Because it wasn't about them. It was about him and God. And man, I will never forget that. Here I am as a child watching my dad want to be just like him. Guys, our kids are affected by how we worship. And if we're standing there unaffected by God, number one, we don't know who God is if we're unaffected by him. Two, shame on us because we're teaching our kids to be unaffected by God. We have to be open. We have to be vulnerable. Man, there's so many times in worship where I'm in tears. I'm crying. Is that a manly thing to do? I'm going to say yes, it is. When God moves us to see who he oh, yeah. is, who I am, what he's done for me, I should be in tears. And my response, my only response is to worship him. That's where we got to get to. And 
And again, it starts with our heart, but we have to look at our family as well and say, man, God is calling me to be a leader to my family. And it requires me to lay my life down, my pride down, my selfishness down, just as Christ laid himself down for the church, laid himself down for us on the cross. We have to be Christ to our family. So it's got to start with us, man. Worship happens when it starts with us as the men. Yes. So I, so I love to talk about worship. <laughs> We're living on borrowed time with this computer, I think. But um, guys, remember this. We talked about this earlier. God created us to worship. Yeah. And you are going to worship something. If you're not worshiping God, if you're not willing to go to church and worship God and give him all of it, where is your worship going? What is stealing that away? Because that's what you need to evaluate. What is taking away your worship for God? Because God is the only one worthy of our worship. And so, Dave, thank you for being with us. This has been a journey, and clearly, Satan is not loving this episode. He's not loving what we're doing, because remember, Satan fights for our worship. And he wants to do everything he can to distract us from worshiping God. And so I hope that men that you have heard this and that you will understand that you have a responsibility to God to demonstrate to your kids how to live a life in Christ. And part of that is how you worship him. And so Dave, thank you for being with us. Uh, it has been a joy to have you with us today. And uh, <laughs> the computer lasted. Made it to Dude, the thank finish. you so much for having me. <laughs> I love you, brother. I love what you're doing. This ministry is awesome and it's been feeding my life. I want you to know that. Guys, back this guy up. Buy some swag. Get you a candle that smells like bourbon or this one's Fruit Loops. <laughs> Support this guy, man. Support him. I love this ministry. Thank you for what you're doing, Sean. <laughs> Well, we, we will have Dave back when we're going to look at some challenges of the ministry and how men can encourage their, their, their ministry staff in that. But if you have enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to get out to make sure that you like or follow or subscribe to it. And above all, get the word out to your friends and family and your churches. Um, introduce it to your men's ministry, guys. Uh, let them know about it. And, and again, I'm going to ask for this because... We need prayer for the production of the Man Up curriculum. We have been getting our butt kicked with technology glitches, and it just continues to manifest itself in this. And so be praying for us because we understand the power of prayer. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And be praying for this ministry that we can get this off the ground because what we know is the enemy does not want men changing their lives drawing closer to God and making right and godly decisions. The enemy doesn't want that. And so he's going to fight it all the way. And so just pray that we would be able to get that out. But let me leave you with a challenge. This Sunday, step out of your comfort zone. If you don't usually sing out loud, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. If you don't usually lift up your hands, Get those hands up in the air and express yourself in worship to God. Whatever you give to your favorite sports team, whatever you give to your favorite thing that you love to do, whether it's your automobile or your hobby, whatever it is, however excited that gets you, get that way for God. Because I know we've got men that get stoked about a lot of things, but we need men who get stoked about God. Because that will change a church. Remember, men, when the church gets the wife, it doesn't get the family. But when the church gets the husband, it gets the family, and things begin to change. Men, it's time. It's time to man up.